Can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Great. I'll just dive into it then. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Michael Moorhead. And for the past, oh gosh, uh, five, six years or so, I have been a co founder and, and now the CEO of a small tech startup um, that specializes in the so called direct volume rendering of large. Uh, image stacks that you might collect from 3D microscopes, but also CT scans and MRIs. Um, this experience has has really been a blessing. I like to complain about it a lot with the uh, huge amount of overwork that, that we do, but uh, to work in such a pioneering field uh, right now is has been incredibly uh, interesting and has provided a lot of opportunities to travel around the world and, and give talks and give demonstrations of the technology. So i um, very happy to be here and uh, show off what we've done at SciGlass um, to you. Um, later after the talk, I'm going to try to keep the talk to 30-35 minutes so we have time to hop into SciGlass. I think everybody should be set up with an installer, but if you're not, let us know and we'll, we'll get you set up. One thing that you can do, um, I'm just gonna go ahead and launch SciGlass really quick. At any time during the talk, um, when we meet in multiplayer, it's crucial that each of us have a copy of the local data uh, installed on our computer. SciGlass now has this capability uh, to import from the data zoo, which is an, an online repo of data sets. And so anytime during the talk, uh, if you're bored of the, the slides that I'm showing, feel free to open up your installation of SciGlass, go into import from data zoo. And just to keep the sizes small, why don't we pick the torso CT scan, which is only six megabytes, and the zebrafish CT scan. I'm sorry that uh, most of these samples are biological. I will show some videos of some material science and talk about where we're going with material science. Um, but for multiplayer, let's grab these two. Feel free to grab any others if you want, if you have plenty of hard drive space um, and we can explore whatever anyone has in multiplayer. Okay, so just to give you a little context, I am talking to you from Morgantown, West Virginia, which is a small college town. It's about an hour south of Pittsburgh. It's about three hours west of Washington, DC, Baltimore. And for the past, let's see, for about Four years, I worked at the West Virginia University Centers for Neuroscientists as a computer scientist, helping neuroscientists uh, deal with their massive amounts of data. Um, some of the things we worked on, uh, let me know if these videos get choppy, but we worked on a thing in neuroscience called connectomics, which is essentially creating a map of every neuron's location and all of the connections it has with every other neuron. This gives you a big network of information. Here's a bunch of uh, 3D segmentation from electron microscopy. I'm going to blitz through a lot of this pretty quickly because uh, it's sort of irrelevant to virtual reality, but it does explain uh, why VR and volumetric imaging is so important these days. So uh, I did a bit of segmentation. This is just sort of the work that I was doing as a master's and PhD candidate. Um, Really, I joined the lab to build a 3D TV version of a cave. If you're not familiar with cave technology, I've got a few other slides. It's essentially a room you can walk into with back projected walls. Typically, they're 3D, so you put on some passive glasses and everything pops out at you. To make these even cheaper, people started making them out of smart 3D TVs. And so that's what we did. About $35,000 went into this project. And we have these nice six LG smart TVs that are stacked up in uh, profile. And you could fit one or two people in here. It was very cool. The cells would pop out at you. But um, these cave systems are extremely expensive. Even the cheapest one is 35000 A typical cave installation, I'll show you a few pictures in a second, are about a million dollars. They can't be moved anywhere. So everyone has to come to you. And really, if you develop specific software for your cave, there's not a huge ecosystem of cave users out there. So all of this changed in 2014-ish when you know, the developer kit for, from Oculus dropped. 
all of these problems were just like sort of checked off like oh great this is going to be an 800 or less dollar unit anyone could get this we can take it to a conference if we want to let's start porting everything that we're doing in the cave into a vr headset and so this is just a little reiteration of that uh, you probably have seen these pictures uh, being in a vr uh, program but uh, my co-founder actually created this slide and I thought it was kind of interesting. If you haven't seen these, um, it's sort of amazing where we've come from, uh, from basically the 1960s with these enormous uh, goggles. And then this one here, this sort of Damocles, which is came down on a pole. And it, it was called that because if that ever became detached and, and fell, uh, the user would be impaled and, and you know, they're dead. So. We've come a long way. Um, obviously, we're in we're in about the third wave of VR right now. Here's a couple of pictures of these caves. If you haven't seen these, you'd think that VR would completely wipe these out, but there are still Fortune 500 companies that are buying these things. Uh, just in the past two weeks, I've had two different requests to support Cyglass in a cave, and so we we're assessing if that is feasible or viable. There's still groups using this, but I think, you know, in 10 years, everyone will just have AR, VR glasses. It, it's just going to be over for caves. Okay. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about all of the different ways you can extract volumetric image data out of scientific samples. Okay. So you may be familiar with some of these, especially CT. This is uh, a movie playing, going down an image stack of a serial block face electron microscopy. Uh, this is a piece of a mouse brain. The way this works is typically with electron microscopy, it's just like light microscopy, but you're firing electrons through the data, so you get higher resolution. For a long time, we could just take a slice of tissue, put it in there, and image it, and you'd get a 2D picture back. Serial block face, on the other hand, we put a little robotic arm inside of the microscope. And what it does, you scan the top of the block of tissue, this little robotic arm comes across with a diamond knife and shaves off about 50 nanometers right off the top. Then you scan again, the diamond knife cuts again, and you keep going. This is a destructive process. So afterwards, the sample is basic. It looks almost like pencil shavings. You can just like blow it and they'll, they'll scatter. They're so thin at 50 nanometers. But you can create these amazing massive stacks. This one was about 1.5 terabytes. And it contains a huge amount of information about these cells. There's about 27 uh, cell bodies in here. And these sort of waving things moving through here, these are myelinated axons that are basically carrying huge amounts of information through the brain from one region to the other. There's a bunch of other ways you can do EM. Now there's focused ion beam, where instead of a diamond knife, you take this literally a laser blaster. And instead of slicing, you just blast off 20 nanometers and, and you can get even better Z resolution. You may or may not have heard of this revolution of uh, clarity, tissue clearing, and, and this technique called light sheet. So with light sheet, what you do, you use special optics. The physics is actually beyond me, but you force light into a very sheet thin of sheet of light. And if you have cleared your tissue, so here is a brain, a little mouse brain. And if you apply the appropriate chemical procedure to it, you can make it optically transparent. If you have optically transparent things, like this is actually, it's a little hard to tell when it's slice by slice, but this is a, the, a snake embryo. Um, so you can see it sort of spiral up. Unfortunately, I don't have a video of it in VR, but it's on the data zoo. So if you get into the data zoo and you wanna see the snake, feel free to pull it down. So if you can clear that tissue, then you just place your sheet of light on the data and you have a camera here and you just pass this sheet of light through the, the whatever you're imaging and take pictures and you get light sheet. You can create, you know, multi hundred gigabyte image stacks of incredible detail. It's, it's really pretty amazing. Um, here's a little bit more on tissue clearing. They have also done this thing called expansion microscopy. Often it is a side effect of clearing where the brain or whatever you're, you're clearing will swell in size. 
And because light has this diffraction limit where you cannot get better resolution with light unless you go down to EM, right? Um, having the brain swell proportionally actually helps you a lot. Everything gets a little bit bigger. And so your imaging tool, your light waves uh, go a lot farther. You can supercharge this idea of light sheet and create what is called the lattice light sheet microscope. Uh, the inventor of this, Eric Betzik, won the Nobel Prize in 2016. This is capable of imaging a 3D volume every second. So essentially you create this light sheet, it sits like this, and you, every second you pass the sample through the light sheet and you collect an entire volume every second. And so that allows you to create 4D movies that even one hour of video will be about a terror terabyte of data. And, and so this is really incredible because in 3D, you can watch this macrophage swim around this fish's ear. And if you have it in VR, you can actually grab it. And it's not a projection. It is a 3D volume. It, it's absolutely stunning. And I think that this is really going to change the way students learn about scientific processes. There will no longer be little cartoons of some drawing of a macrophage you will see this and, and you'll really understand how uh, very small um, uh, you know, immune system operators move around your body and eat things. It's, it's, it's a great time to be alive for science. Okay, um, one of the, if, if all of these imaging uh, techniques were stocks, I would be the most bullish about micro CT. It is incredible technology what, what we have done uh, with micro CT. So you take the same concepts of, of CT, you shrink down the volume and you can achieve very, very high resolution. I want you to pay attention to this data set because I'm gonna show you a video of it in VR instead. This is every blood vessel of the mouse's brain imaged with micro CT. Before they did it, they inject the brain, all the blood vessels with, um, a very, uh, let's see, what do they use? Sorry, I'm blanking on, on, on the fluid that they pump into the veins, but it makes it very opaque to the CT. So you get incredible signal to noise. You've just got like almost pure white wherever there's a blood vessel and almost pure blackness where there's not. And so I'll show you that, keep in mind the, the difficulty in piecing this structure together as you look at it slice by slice, and then we'll look at it in 3D in a little bit. Micro CT is really cool. You might have also heard that people are using synchrotrons where you take these electrons and you spin them very fast around a very large ring and then slam it into things. The researchers are now getting electron microscope levels of resolution through micro CT with synchrotron uh, power. This is really interesting because micro CT and CT, they're non-destructive. You can image these large volumes get these nice high resolution images, but then you still have the data, you still have the sample. So it'll, it'll be very interesting over the next five years to see what people do with synchrotron micro. Finally, there are still companies out there pushing the limit on, on just conventional CT. Uh, we work with a group called Epica International that, that basically makes specialized CT for horses and dogs. And it's pretty interesting. They have sort of a hybrid cone beam serial imaging platform that gives you pretty good isotropic resolution. This is another data set that I want you to look at for a second and watch as it moves through slice by slice, because in the next slide, I'm going to show it to you in SciGlass. So it's a little blurry and it's, it's somewhat difficult to understand these little blips that show up and disappear. Viewing things like this is, is how we've always done it, but it doesn't have to be like this. So if you do so-called direct volume rendering, I'm just gonna skip this. Oh, okay, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll, we'll, we'll see it in VR soon. Let me, let me justify why we should look at things in VR. Um, we have all the super complicated data. It's very hard to understand. I'm not gonna get into, uh, if I was talking to a bunch of PIs, researchers, uh, I'd be like, you need to spend your grant money effectively, right? Uh, because nobody's getting free money from the government anymore. Um, so let's take advantage of our entire visual cortex by seeing things in stereo, right? 
So this is a brief primer into what we do at SciGlass. This is called direct volume rendering. The idea has been around since the 50s, but we really haven't had the hardware resources to do this effectively. Um, there have been many uh, volume rendering software solutions that are just 2D that typically as you like move it around, it gets a little blurry. And then as you, you stop it, finally the com computation has enough time to, to do this and it all becomes clear. At SciGlass, we, we can do this at 90 Hertz. So here is the recipe for direct volume rendering. For every pixel that you need to place on the VR screen or just a 2D screen, you fire a ray. That ray will travel through your 3D volume, which you can think of as a 3D matrix of values, of intensity values. As you move through that sample, that ray will basically pick up values and it will create a vector of numbers that it passed through. Then you return that vector of rays back to that, that pixel location. And then you have to make a decision. What do I project, what do I put on that individual pixel? And so you can do some, some compute on it, on that vector. So if you just take all of the numbers in that vector and you average them, you'll get something that looks like this approximately. Another really popular technique in, in microscopy and others is so-called maximum projection, where you just take the brightest number for that vector and you display it. These are both good. It gives you pretty cool results here. But if you do something a little trickier, there's the so-called absorption emission model, well studied in graphics, where each voxel both emits and absorbs light depending on uh, some settings that you apply. You can achieve something like this, an, opacity slider that you can you can apply and make things make that ray essentially stop when it hits something solid. That's really useful when you're looking at data because these depth cues where something is in front of the other, if you look at averaging or maximum intensity projection, you cannot really tell when the eyeball is in front of the brain. But with a if you can achieve an opacity, now you can tell when things are in front of other things. And these depth cues are very important. So you need to do this for every pixel, for both eyes at 90 Hertz. This is an engineering challenge. And this is one of the reasons SciGlass has been so useful because it's some, somewhat difficult to do and we've, we've managed to achieve this. Okay, now I'm gonna take you back to the CT uh, and, and just take you know 10 seconds to look at this thing. And now we're gonna look at it in SciGlass. So if you pull off your direct volume rendering, this is what it'll look like. Here is the horse's hoof image with CT. And I was really startled when I loaded this data into SciGlass because when you look at it slice by slice, super blurry, super fuzzy, but there's something about stacking all the images up and, and having it in direct volume rendering or, or it's not a hologram, but it's sort of like holding a hologram in front of your face. Now you can really understand the structure of the bone, the structure of these blood vessels that ring the horse's hoof, um, things that my mind could not connect up when looking at it slice by slice become very clear, very obvious. I've got a few other data sets. Um, this is light sheet microscopy. This is half of a mouse brain with a vector uh, vector injected label, basically, um, to light up all of these neurons. Uh, it's quite fantastic, quite beautiful. Maybe one day this will end up on the data zoo for people to check out. It's a little big. It's probably 300 or 400 gigabytes, but maybe we'll, we'll get it up there one day. Let me see if I can get out of this movie. OK. So if you happen to know anything about graphics, You'll, you, you'll have heard me just say that we were rendering like a 300 or 400 gigabyte data set. You'll know, Michael, you know that it's crazy. You can't, you can only render what's in the video card. And typically video cards these days only have one gig of, or sorry, eight gigabytes of, of video RAM. You can spend more money and get 24, uh, but you're really limited by the amount of data that you can render. So at SciGlass, what we've done here is we've created a so-called octree out of core rendering system where we've taken the data set and we've chunked it up into small blocks 
and we've created copies of those blocks at higher and lower resolutions. Just like in Google Maps, when you zoom out and you see all of uh, maybe the UK, right? You don't see a lot of detail, but as you zoom in further and further, we load in, this is sometimes referred to as level of detail in video games. That's usually for meshes. This is for volumetric data, so it's a little bit different, but essentially we do the same thing. Any data sets that are close to your eyes, we load in smaller block chunks that have higher amounts of resolution where data that's far away from you, far away from your eyes, we keep low res. And if you do this fast enough, swapping these blocks in and out, um, the user doesn't even know it and it's like a seamless experience. So, sorry, this there's some sound on this one. So that micro CT of every blood vessel in the mouse's brain, here it is again in Cyglass. This is about a hundred gigabyte uh, data set and you can, basically seamlessly walk through it. I'll just play that one more time. I'm not sure how these videos are coming through on your side, a um, little choppy probably, but um, so much more um, spatial understanding by seeing it in this way than seeing it 2D. Uh, so Rich sent me uh, some nice, I think it's a like an air filter. Rich, do you wanna comment on this? Sorry, trying to find the mute button. Um, it's a, actually this is, um, it's a face mask. So, you know, pandemic related research. Um, so this is, it's a FFP3 mask, uh, which we're looking at. Yeah, so super dense. I wanted to put this right next to uh, the micro CT of the brain blood vessels, because I was sort of surprised how similar they look in, in a way. Uh, so here, you know, this is brain and then this is the filter. And I think the similarities are, are striking. The analysis that a neuroscientist might be interested in doing is probably very similar to the analysis that a material scientist might wanna do on the density of, of these fibers. Um, it, so. Yeah, that's a good point. And there's loads of kind of tools in that arena, more so than material science, I find actually. Yeah, yeah. So I, I can imagine someone trying to uh, skeletonize all of these these fibers and then understand maybe I don't know if they would branch but um, fascinating data set and I will be uploading this um, for us to look at I don't know if we'll have time it's a little big at, at half a gig but I'll share it around and you can load it into Cyglass if you want to check it out okay let's see here okay let, let me check the time here Let's see, how are we doing? Okay, so maybe about 10 more minutes of talking and then we'll dive into a VR demo uh, if everyone has their headsets ready. So at Cyglass, visualizing is one thing. We thought that that was basically gonna be enough and scientists were just gonna be like, oh, please let me give you all of my money. And it turns out scientists really want to quantify things and they don't, they're not really that impressed by high-end visualization. They need to get their papers out. And so, we started building quantification tools. And one of the, the simplest things that you can do is you can pull the trigger on a VR controller and you can drop a dot. And we had, a, there's a bunch of neuroscientists that are counting things, counting cells uh, in, in microscopy data sets. And one of our students in the research lab we were in actually needed to count as many cells as she could very quickly. And doing it in 2D on Fiji or ImageJ, if you're familiar with that software, you can count maybe 20 or 30 cells per second, which is great. Uh, before, actually a talk I did yesterday, I did a little speed trial where I tried to go as fast as we could in Cyglass counting these cells. And you can get about 76 cells per minute, which is about two or three times faster than you can go in 2D. That's a big improvement. No one's satisfied with that. Everybody wants completely automated. Uh, and so in Cy at Cyglass, we built this completely automated cell counting, which depending on the amount of cells basically gives you results instantaneously. You do have to come back and, and do some proofreading. No algorithm is gonna give you 100% accuracy, but you can get a lot more done a lot faster, right? 
So we do have a lot of data over time, as I, I sort of indicated. I'm going to skip through. Essentially, we've done the same thing. You can basically place dots as things move through time. I'm just going to show this, this scene. This is a, a cancer cell with philopodia. That's what these little green guys are. And this cancer cell is like reaching out and looking you know, for things to eat, probably. Uh, and so we, we have enabled researchers to track things through time much faster. And the group that uses it has reported that it's about eight times faster than the way they were doing it before they got into VR. Pretty significant speed up. We can do volumetric segmentation. This one is a little too specific to biology. Um, this is, there's a thing called a, a dendritic spine that neuroscientists are really interested in, in understanding the shape of these things. We've made it a volumetric painting tool where you can place a region of interest around some data and then bring your painter in and, and just highlight with different colors these things. And then we, we've implemented marching cubes in SciGlass so that you can turn these things into meshes. Another thing that's very common in neuroscience is trying to understand the branching structure of neurons. And so let me just hop to where we're actually tracing. And so you might want to uh, trace the structure of this neuron. This is sort of, this is an automated system that sort of snaps to the brightest thing in the scene. There's a lot of segmentation efforts in neuroscience and, and structural biology. And so one thing you might want to do is just look at the segmentation that you've performed with the volumetric data at one time. And so there's lots of groups that use this as a proofreading tool. I'm just going to skip through some of this because it's okay. So this is something brand new and something more interesting, I think, to material scientists. I wanted to show this on some real data, um, but our, our corporate customer basically made us sign tons of NDAs, so we can't do that. This is a, a very fast measurement tool that you place this box on the data and from the top of the box through, we fire a bunch of those same rays that we use for, for visualization. We reuse that code to basically perform sort of an auto caliper. So that these rays will snap to the structure. And as they pass through it, they will assess the histogram of the data within it. And with that, we can report back the thickness of whatever you just measured, the average intensity, the, uh, the porosity, and basis weight. And so for fabric structures that have holes in them, you can think of like maybe paper towels or sponges like that. Being able to quickly measure along some strange edge, um, the density of, of voxels within that uh, structure, within that small region of interest could be very valuable for specific material science groups. And, and so we've done that. And, and I think there's, there's sort of a bright future of uh, creating measurements inside of virtual reality that you really would have trouble doing on a 2D screen. Okay, um, I'm just gonna use the last five minutes or so to talk about our machine learning interface here. Um, it's my belief that we're sort of, we're still really at the beginning of machine learning where we, we sort of like train a deep neural network, we run it, and then we look at the results in 2D. And it's sort of a slow and tedious process. I think in the future, we will be running deep neural networks on data almost in real time while in VR, and we'll be interacting with those results. Those results will be brought back into the deep neural network. And so we'll have the so-called online learning where the human acts as a human in the loop. And so I'll just show a couple examples here that some of our customers have done. This is uh, synaptic vesicle pre and post synaptic vesicle locations that were found with a deep neural network and then scattered throughout the project. And if we zoom in here, we can see that there's sort of a one-to-one -one correlation between uh, these synaptic vesicles uh, and, and their, their locations. This is a, a brand new feature that, that we're building into SciGlass for sort of the over segmentation, the creation of super voxels uh, on data that also respond to a mask. So here in green, this is a membrane detection uh, deep neural network that is applied to this electron microscopy. 
And then inside of SciGlass, we have created these so-called super voxels, which are agglomerations of voxels that are like each other. And in SciGlass, what you can do now, which I think is, is really exciting, is you can bring out a little uh, dot and you can say, I wanna merge these super voxels together. And so instead of like carefully painting, doing segmentation manually where you might, you might make a mistake, these super voxels, since they behave, they follow uh, these boundaries, they won't cross these boundaries, you can just, just do merging of super voxels, which is a lot faster than manually painting. And it sort of ensures that you never go outside of the lines. And so there's some, some more work to be done here, but I'm really excited about how this may speed up segmentation times. Finally, I'll just spend the last three minutes talking about communication. We're all gonna see it because we're all gonna dive into multiplayer in about five minutes. Um, but during COVID, we basically dedicated all of our resources uh, to building out online multi-view. We'll check it out. Uh, so I won't, won't talk much more here. On top of that, in the same system that, that we built the multiplayer, we also have created the system of SciGlass narrations, which is a recording of your voice along a timeline paired with every action that you take in SciGlass. So this isn't multiplayer, but this is a way for one person, like a lecturer, to communicate information as an immersive virtual reality experience. So I can hand you this, uh, this so-called narration and you can press play and this little avatar will come out and he'll do everything that I did and say everything that I said. And, and so we, on top of that, we've put in uh, 2D slides on the walls and there, there's a tons of other stuff that goes into that, but lecturers can now make these narrations and then share them indefinitely uh, as you will. I've already talked about the data zoo. Uh, that's a way for us to share data sets and presentations. And I'm just gonna skip through this stuff. We're working with a couple groups from the NIH and Janelia to hook up to their very large uh, databases. This is, it's kind of fun. This is the, this is micro CT of the fly's leg. This is a little cross-sectional uh, section of, of the fly's leg. And you can see striated muscle here. That's kind of cool. And these are individual hairs sitting off the leg. It's amazing. Um, and then this group at Genelia, they're applying machine learning to electron microscopy at the single cell level. So this is one cell, it has been imaged with EM, and then they've applied a bunch of different deep neural networks to segment out all the different structures in here. So if you, you know, had to learn about mitochondria in high school, um, imagine learning it this way, where you, instead you're like, all right, let's, uh, let's take a tour through a cell, literally. So we're hooking up to their database and, and SciGlass users will be able to access this. There's a free version of SciGlass View. We are working to get it on Steam right now, actually. They keep uh, rejecting us for minor art detail. Um, but essentially everything that I've just talked about in terms of communication will be available for free. And so we think this will be a, a really great uh, pipeline for sort of state-of-the-art research to be shared with um, you know, scientifically interested people at large. And I think, uh, yeah, there's a little thing I'm gonna skip here. I think that's it. So uh, thank you for your 35 minutes of attention. And why don't we all try it out inside virtual reality? I guess we could take two minutes for questions if anyone has anything they wanna talk about. It is an overwhelming presentation, maybe like too much information at one time. So uh, we can talk in, in VR. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to ask the question. So just a quick one, I do, would you call, while um, we do have a lot of the VR MSC people, uh, there are people who are in our lecture right now who won't be joining us in VR this, this time. Uh, we will probably do a second version of this talk. So I said, uh, just to Lindsay, just recently, the biologists are busy today because they're all doing their field work. So I'd love them to come and see this project because we've now merged our college with them. So we'll do another talk and hopefully the VR lab will not be, well, the VR lab's not in the quarantine now, but which massively uh, needs 
maintenance. So we'll be able to show you guys and get you guys in who are, aren't part of the main VR group and have a go. Uh, so the question, so thank you very much, Michael. Great talk. Uh, I love this stuff. A uh, question I wanted to ask you was, um, you're talking about machine learning and uh, what you call this recognition of these parts. And I was thinking I've seen uh, what you call Richard's crew just spend hours in Firefly and other things, painting layers and stuff for crystal structures and stuff. Do you think it will, your machine learning algorithms will easily pass on to those systems or are they, is it very particular? Is it how much customizability is there from an end user's perspective? Yeah, so un unfortunately with deep neural networks, one of the main problems, and you'll, you'll probably hear this in, in literature as you look into it more, um, is you need a bunch of training data Right, and so you'll still need that human to manually annotate a bunch before you can train the deep neural network. There are a lot of efforts right now in so-called domain adaptation or domain transfer, where you take an, uh, a deep neural network that has been trained at a task, but maybe not specifically for that data set. So it may be good at looking at cells, but only from EM. And you perform this so-called domain adaptation where you change the weights of the deep neural network so that it works on your data without any uh, ground truth, without any human and you know um, training data. And, and so hopefully we'll see, but we're hoping that we'll start to begin to see many more architecture of, of deep neural networks that come out that require less and less uh, human annotated ground truth. Well, um, I think we talked about this before, Michael. Um, like when we do training of data for micro CT, but it'd be the same for anything else. It's usually 2D coloring of slices, and then you move six slices on, color some more, color some more. Whereas, like when I've been painting in side glass, like just with one movement <clears throat> of my hand, I've painted, I don't know, 50 to 100 slices. <clears throat> I mean, so it'd be, I don't know, making that jump, I don't know if it's impossible but moving from right you know that activity right. painting in 3d is instantly better than the 2d alternative i i and totally agree yeah and and we have always been super excited about this painting brush that we've developed but for let me see if i can turn on my vr quickly enough here i can some of this data it's incredibly hard to get the contours correct especially as you move through the stack. With 2D, you're sort of lucky because you're just projecting along a 2D uh, plane and, and you can draw very nicely. But if you have multiple shaped contours moving through Z, it's very difficult. That's where that super voxel creation and then just the merging of those super voxels uh, may help out. Okay, I'll give that a try. Is that soon? It is soon. Uh, okay. We can get you an early uh, version that has that capability in there. Okay, that would be cool. Yeah, I've been painting recently and just, I paint outside the lines, which isn't ideal, obviously, so, yeah. Yeah, so some, some of that electron microscopy segmentation that groups keep, you know, a small army of undergrads on staff and they just do this 2D tracing for out, you know, 40 hours a week for their entire lives. Mm. And it's, it's a sad existence. So anything we can do to help them out, you know, would be great. Um, so, Lindsay and Nathan, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about how, are we just joining a Leon, public do you have, server? Leon, do you have a question? Did you have a question, Leon? Yeah, I had a quick question. So obviously, um, segmentation we've already discussed is a huge bottleneck. Um, yeah. Having been doing CT stuff for over 10 years now, I dread to think how many hours that's been in front of a screen going slice by slice. Now, if you do automated segmentation using whatever techniques, you can get an okay-ish result. Right. But if you want it to be nice, you go in and you manually, like you might do something semi-automated to start with and you go in to tidy up afterwards. Um, have you, do you have any sense with, with the kind of stuff that you're doing? Have you tried using the same data set and giving it to X number of people, telling them to segment it and then hmm. bring that to a ground truth to see what the variation is in you? Because obviously the, the I mean, I see it two ways. Obviously, seeing it in 3D gives you such a better sense as to what's going on. However, 
that familiarity of using a mouse or maybe a stylus on a screen. So I've got a big, nice uh, Wacom screen to do that. And we're, we're used to drawing and painting. Great. But moving our hands in 3D space without any tactile haptic feedback um, is really, it's a strange environment yeah. that we're not yet used to. Um, mm. Yeah, for, have you got any kind of sense of what the user usability, the, the repeatability of this is? We haven't run that experiment. I, I think it, I think you're right, it would be poor. Um, not only is there a skill in, in painting in 3D, but you also need to understand the anatomy or whatever you're segmenting well. And, and so that's another complication. Uh, when, when these groups perform these massive segmentation on the EM, I know they often have two students segment the same thing and they use that as, as, a, as a double check. Uh, but it is a, it's a massive problem. I mean, I, I don't have a silver bullet for it. As we work to uh, sort of in this direction of super voxels and just merging and splitting these super voxels, I do think that will help out a lot. But I think there will always be some subjectivity in it where one expert may not agree with another expert's segmentation. Well, I mean, yeah, absolutely subjectivity. In addition to that, how you've set up your, you know, if you're doing it on a computer, how you set up your monitor. Have you got a window with uh, with the blinds and glare coming in? And the, there's so much about like thresholding and stuff like that. But I think I think having this as an additional tool, I don't think it's going to be just in 3D or just in 2D. Right. But this to supplement the other methods is incredibly powerful. I think from my experience, so the context. Sorry, guys, really no, uh, can we can we can we go well, can we move on to the other one? I'm sorry, that would be quite a right. because I accidentally started a big like segmentation conference, which um, knowing Richard and the others, what do you call, could go on for go on for days. Um, so we have another talk starting at next, so I'd like to move on to the rest of it so you guys can continue the conversation afterwards. Sounds good. Yeah, should we try to get into VR? And uh, Nathan and Lindsay, are, are we just meeting in a public room or? It's completely up to you. I scheduled a room, but we can just jump into the public room for ease. Let's try it. Yeah. So if everyone has Cyglass up, all you have to do is go multiplayer online and then join public server. And let's just try public room number one. Let's see what happens when we go in there. And I'll just continue uh, sharing my screen. Right now in multiplayer, everyone comes in muted. And so since some people will not be in VR, why don't we just use uh, the Zoom audio rather than unmuting ourselves inside of Cyglass. Oh, good. Let's see, my VR didn't quite turn on here. Cool. From where you are, Michael, in Sweden space. Just getting in now. Let's see. All right. Great. So maybe we can wait a little bit uh, for others to come in, and then we can launch a data set. That's easy. Super cool. I haven't actually done this yet. Oh, yeah. So um, let's see, if you assign your controller to the multiplayer tool, I guess, should we have a crash course here? Um, our, our student will student, oh, great. We've got the, uh, the controls up. It's great, Lindsay, nice job. Um, we can fire confetti from our controllers if you, if you switch to your multiplayer tool. Um, I guess we can just launch a data set. Let's see. Can anyone not see this body? Okay. 
So I can see it. Yep, I can see. Great, great. So we can cut here. If we did want to have a, a mini uh, segmentation conference inside of VR, um, <laughs> the, the ROI tool and the painting tools do now come over, over the internet. So you should be able to see this box that I'm placing around the kidney. This is a special case in segmentation where the objects that you want to segment is surrounded by darker voxels. And so it's, it's easy to threshold things away. And then, then you don't really have to worry about painting in the lines, right? You can just paint this whole thing. That's like the easiest case. Can everyone see that? Yep. Made a little mistake here, but. Let's see here, what else can we do? So yeah, I mean, we can talk about these data sets. Is someone the leader? I'm unable to move the data anymore. Oh, Lindsay's yeah, got a hat on, does that mean? <laughs> so there <laughs> is now this capability, oh, let's see. So now I have a star on my head. Ah, okay. What did and mean? that makes me the leader. And so only I can move the data around um, or control the settings. This is like teacher mode or something like that. Um, I'm going to resign from the leader. Oh, yeah. When I'm the leader, you can also see my menu. Yeah. And so I can sort of teach you like, OK, if I adjust this contrast slider, that makes our, our whites wider, makes everything more gray. We can change the intensity. Here's this maximum intensity projection that I, I talked about earlier. Since the bone is the densest thing, uh, you know, it comes through the most. We have a pseudo surface slider that doesn't seem to want to turn on right now. Value color map, lots of different uh, visualization settings here. So I think we just lost, lost Nathan and Mark, maybe. <laughs> yeah, in and out. Oh, that's my that's that's just my bad link cable keeps dying. I need to replace it. Gotcha, gotcha. So yeah, I don't like doing in monitor mode. Just having some headset trouble. Okay. Um, any students coming in? Um, I think as you call, I don't I don't know which ones. Are. I know that um, well, Joe joined us yesterday, and I think um, Seb said he was busy. Uh, okay. While doing others. I'm not sure if, if anyone is if anyone is um, joining. Could you put in chat if you are if you are going to join. If not, sorry, but you got at least uh, we had a play yesterday with some of the students. Cool. Great. It was, it was quite fun to cut in the data and seeing what the others were doing. Okay. Yeah. So you can uh, continue using it in the free version of Cyglass now. You can even load your own data sets in. Um, so if there's interest, if you do want to try some segmentation. Uh, in Cyglass and see if the 3D painting is helpful or not that helpful. Uh, feel free to bring in your own data and give it a go. So with um, our own data, Michael, does it need to go into the zoo first? It, do it does not. Uh, ah, okay. it, it's just like loading in data into the regular version. Yeah. Um, we decided to open it up. Most of the, t oh yeah, that's the problem. Most of the tools are not um, able to be used in the free version. So you can move and you can cut, and I think you can take pictures, um, but you can't segment. But we'll give you uh, some some free licenses to distribute to the students if they want to, to give it a go with a full version. Because we've got paid one in the lab, so if I was leaving it from one of those accounts, doing everything I want to, and say the rest of the people in the room are using the free version, how would that work? Would they yeah, so they, they could join in, they could watch, they could okay. move the data and slice, but they couldn't like paint, they couldn't okay. segment, they couldn't measure things, they couldn't use the counting tool. You okay. could, yeah, um, and you could show those things to them. Okay. But they, if they do want to interact and they, they want to try it out, we can uh, throw some temporary licenses to you and uh, they, can, they can get in there. Well, so there's 
So you've got like, I think the gills you segmented them. Yeah, so uh, the gills are also nicely thresh, yeah. thresholdable, I guess is the word. And so uh, very complicated structure there, yeah. kind of hard to get at in 2D, but in 3D, it's a big time saver. And that would be my point with segmentation in 3D, is that you get the context of the shape. So like in 2D, there might be something next to it, like muscle tissue that looks like a fiber, looks like the gills have these kind of branches coming off. Whereas yeah. in 3D, it's, you, you remove that decision a lot of the time because as long as you know what you said, you, know, you have to be an expert. Um, but some things you just need to know that a gill looks a bit different to muscle tissue. And so right. the statement yeah. the right thing. Whereas in 2D, you can give that to people and the 2D, it looks exactly the same as the thing next to it. Um, I must admit from my work with anatomy was finding that people had some weird views about what leg muscles were, especially because they're so overlapping, complex, they're not really shown or demonstrated correctly. So I'm actually my attempt to do this one for the um, sports science anatomy because they, we do use a data set, but I was a bit disappointed to find out most of it wasn't segmented in CT. Some of it is uh, artistic set, uh, representation. Yeah, yeah. It, the... Sorry, is when the... If that's just kind of Laura's gang, is it? Mark? Laura's Laura's class. We do, well, she does it for the medical engineers and for the uh, others. We were using the Japanese life science database. I know they use the Japanese life science database over in um, uh, the medical school as well. But the more I spend on it, the time I spend on that database, the more I realize it's based on one Japanese man. So you're getting a very strong um, bias towards, uh, I can see Nightmare. My, my, <laughs> Michael's nodding along. <laughs> yeah. We were going to, um, so Wendy, you know Wendy Francis, don't you? Uh, Wendy, Har Wendy Harris or Wendy Francis? Yeah. So we, we were looking at a grant to try and, it's about reducing animal use for labs, so dissections effectively. Um, that was only a small grant. Not to get on, but the thoughts were around using CT data and segment, so segmentation would be the biggest thing to create the data set. Then we've got the data set forever, but repeated classes per year, but then obviously you could teach with your missing environment if you could. Yeah. All right. Um could we could we sort of just call thanks for thanks for showing Michael. That's absolutely great. Um, sure. Please switch over to questions from the general audience. I know that there's we've got some felt followers from people who are thinking about doing doing VR as a degree doing as a, as a degree leading on into work or research. And I think we've got uh, researchers from things. So if you're welcome from both questions, but the the VR researchers will be going off to another talk with Mar Mar from uh, Microsoft, who does our avatar stuff at um, on, the dot, uh, on the end of the hour. So uh, other people are welcome to stay in this Zoom room and keep talking if uh, Michael has time, but I'd like to hear some questions now. I had a Quick following question, if uh, not segmentation related, are you able to read in um, other kinds of data sets which aren't uh, volume files, so things like VTKs, things like that? So we support OBJs for meshes, um, and now we support some CAD models. Um, VTK, I'll have to look into. Is that just a mesh file format? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, if you're familiar with Kitware, who do like Paraview and things like that. Right. So that's one of the standard ones. Uh, and you can, so one of the things that they're working on now is that you can, with say simulation data, you can save not just the static image, but uh, kind of a dynamic image and output it um, in a format um, suitable for kind of AR. I can't, I can't remember the, like, you know, the AR scenes you can save. Um, yeah, gotcha. Image. Yeah, so we a lot of our customers have asked us about the visualization of simulation data. Uh, and we've sort of been waiting for a standard file format. Um, <laughs> but, but I'll I'll look into that because because that sounds you know intriguing on that front. Yeah, I think you'll be waiting a very long time for a standard uh, format. Yeah. I have one more question before I go. Um, what do you think of the looking glass, Michael? Do you think that's a useful tool? I, if I had a little more disposable income, I would buy one. Um, they're very cool. The, I think the problem 
we, we've even thought about getting one for, for a conference booth to kind of show off some of our data. You do need to render, I think, 64 different views and sort of store them. That paradigm doesn't totally work with Sideglass, so it would take us a little bit of effort. But if we could do it, I would I would put looking glass units everywhere. I mean, they're a little expensive. The small one isn't too bad. Um, I think they're great. Yeah, I would I would use one. Thank you much. Michael, can you just rotate your your head, please, in the VR room, just to show the screen? Sure, oh, sure. The headset, not your head. Uh, that. Yeah was the data set. So Lindsay has gotten a uh, some moon rocks, I think. Lindsay, do you want to talk about that for a second? Yeah, so NASA have done a, an asteroid materials um, project quite recently in which certain asteroid materials they're putting through X-ray CT machines. And this is freely available on their website. And I downloaded the TIFF stack and loaded it into SciGlass for you guys. Um, and this is just then a picture that I took as a screen grab to put on the TV inside VR. And if I find the link, I can then give it to you from where I source the data. I had to play with that one yesterday and put it up as my, what is, what is this image? Yeah, because I found the voids in the middle, but I wasn't sure what the rest of it was. Yeah, I'd given it to you and I'd, I hadn't realized I'd done another video of it, but no one noticed. <laughs> well, thank you very much for that, Lindsay. All right, thank you very much, all guys. I'm going to jump over to the other room just in case Mars already joined. Um, any, everyone else who wants to talk about a big conversation about segmentation and other stuff is welcome to stay here. Thank you, Michael. Um, we'll be in talks um, again because I think, would you call, by the sounds of it, Richard and Wendy are already considering looking at something like this to solve the problem, would you call solve the problem? I think it already covers the problem, so it'd be quite interesting to have a bigger conversation with, with that later. Great. Thank you very much, guys. Um, yeah, thanks for you, having us. See you all the rest of you who are following us in the next room, okay? Mark. Bye. Thanks. Um, I'm gonna try and make some of the host. I'm gonna make a host. I'm gonna make Richard the host. That way, you should stay on. Cool. Yeah, Richard, you're the host, there you go. Okay, Mark. I forgot my camera was on me this whole time. So I didn't do that. <laughs> um, I'll take this off for a minute then. So who's still around? Uh, oh, Nick, Jebin. Um, so Nicola and Jebin are PhD students in the group. So work with micro CT data um, of various types. Um, Nick's working on biological materials. Jebin's working on biological and, and human made. Um, but looking at more correlative imaging, so bringing data sets from different techniques together um, yep. and trying to use that context of one technique to inform the next. Um, and so, yeah, actually, hmm. so yeah, Jebin, you were asking the other day about what software is good for, because what we have, say we x-ray a sample, we can get the 3D data, but then Jebin wants to do um, like chemical analysis, EDS of something internal. So then we take that sample, mount it, grind it down to the layer that we want. Um, but then relating that to where we were in 3D can be a bit quite a, a difficult process. Um, whereas you know, the outside of it will be the same shape apart from that you ground away. Um, so it's possible to think about landmarks and things like that. But yeah, one way of doing it, can you load in like a 2D image into the 3D space inside glass? I hadn't thought of that before. Right. I don't know. Nathan, what do you think about that one? Yeah, we can load in a 2D image as a 3D volume. Uh, it will appear to be flat. It could be 2D. It could be registered to a 3D image. Ooh, OK. So yeah, we'd have like the original CT scan and then the, the SEM image that's like halfway down the sample. You could potentially stack something like that. Yeah, you, you probably have more sophisticated um, registration systems. But have you seen the the Cyglass registration system? I think I have a quick movie here. I don't think so. It it's just manually placed landmarks. So this is so called cord of light and electron microscopy. On the right is the yeah. EEM. Over here, there's some light microscopy, and we're just placing points, fiduciary markers, you know, on structures that are in both data sets. 
if you place about four of them, the more, the better, the more accurate you'll get. And then we use Procrustes method to minimize the distance between them. So it's not fancy. There's no warping or anything like that. Uh, they will trigger the, the registration here, but you could do something like this. And then you would, we can even give you back the, uh, the transformation matrix that maps from one to the other. So you could go from any arbitrary voxel to any other, you know, arbitrary voxel. Okay. Yeah, that might be worth looking at. So those two data sets there, were they, is that 2D, two, two sets of 2D data? Those are both actually 3D, but they're very thin. Um, ah, okay. Now, but you, just as Nathan was saying, you could just load in a data set as a single image. Now, yeah. if, you, if you select two data sets and press launch, they'll both come in side by side. Okay. Yeah, Jebin, I don't know if, uh, just check you hadn't wandered off and didn't hear any of that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm here. Um, that would be worth a quick try, I think. Yeah, yeah, uh, that, that's quite interesting. Yeah, that's instantly, yeah, instantly simpler than the Zeiss option. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot more intuitive, isn't it? Like one yeah, yeah, 3D, yeah. like, yeah. Just everything's easier. What about um, maybe, so you drill into this thing and, and you take a core sample. What about putting like a, a metal BB into that core sample and then imaging it again? I, I don't know how destructive drilling into the core, core is, but. Um, to, to make that like a false marker effectively than the 3D. So um, it's extremely bright and you're like, okay, that's exactly where we, we drilled. Yeah, I think, yeah, I guess it depends on the sample for, for the biological stuff. There's usually enough shape and, and right. form. It's the, like when you talk about metals and like for pores and things, maybe it'd be a bit more tricky, but yeah, this, there's a few things actually we'll try this on. That would be quite good. Um, yeah. I, I was speaking with a, another customer. They always, they strap, they, they just tape BBs onto the surface of things all the time okay. uh, to act as fiduciary markers. It might be something to consider. Yeah, I mean, the one we're talking about now is it's a like um, a denticle from a, a particular array, and so it has a quite a specific shape. Gotcha. Uh, like a spike. So I think we might be able to to line that up. Definitely something to try. And so Jevin, we've got we used to have just the license that was on my dongle, but you could use this in the lab potentially as well. Um, and we could both look at it. That's something that we haven't done yet, actually. So oh, you cool. can be in the lab and I can be on this one and tech. So with the data, would we need, we'd, yeah, we'd have to have the same side glass file locally on each yeah. machine. And, and so for Teams, one, one thing that we've done recently is we have this system that you can sort of strangely access through import projects. You can sync a directory of projects. And this is really to be used for things like Dropbox or OneDrive yeah. or some service like that, that automatically syncs projects between teams. Okay. You can set your OneDrive, we use OneDrive here. I have a bunch of projects in my OneDrive folder and I've shared this with Nathan, Nathan and Lindsay. And basically what this sync folder will, will do is every time SciGlass is created, it looks in that folder for any new projects that have been synced by OneDrive or um, Dropbox or something like that yeah. and automatically imports them. Oh. So if, if you set this up, you have a folder that's shared with your team, everybody sets it as their sync folder. When you go into multiplayer, everyone should have the same projects automatically. Mm, that is good. Yeah, because at the moment we use the machine in uni, which is obviously better than the laptop I've been using for the last however long. Um, and then I was thinking I've done all the work on this one, it'd be a pain just to drag that across. But obviously I'll do it once, but um, then it'll just keep updating, which would be good. Okay, yeah, yeah these are all, sorry if you, you know, you're going past the kind of time you were doing on Mark stuff, but yeah. No problem, no problem. <laughs> Happy to talk. Cool. And just if I can clarify, Rich, with your yeah. latest renewal, you got two oh, extra yeah. licenses with that. So you've actually got three complete um, copies of SciGlass. Awesome. And for this course, I gave Mark uh, just a team of 10 for anyone to test out. So he has an extra license for 10 people for the month. Wow. OK. Yeah. Thanks for yeah. Thanks for everything with that. Um, so it's mainly been me on SciGlass rather than the rest of the team. Um, one, because I got into it and... It's the type of thing I would do at odd times. Um, but yeah, that'll help them just knowing that 
it's not who's got the dongle over the chair at the time. And it's, you know, we three would be great for us, actually. Um, yeah. And it's an easy one to get into. I think it's like, yeah, saying to the gang, oh, try a Dragonfly and try a Viso. And it's, it's quite, um, you require quite a bit of time to get into it. And yeah, yeah. and if you know they're going to be using that for three years, then that's fine. But actually, Sideglass, you it's intuitive. You can get into it and just visualize and move things around quite quickly. So, I think yeah, it's definitely worth having a play with. Maybe because headsets are quite cheap these days, so it might be worth just getting headsets for people for individuals, especially now with COVID and things. Then everyone's got their own personal one. The co cost is coming down. Of course, you need like the the local GPU. Um, yeah. You may have seen this announcement from NVIDIA about cloud rendering for VR. Oh, yeah. And so that's something that we're really interested in pursuing. So you don't need to have a laptop. You just have an inexpensive standalone headset like a Quest, but maybe even less than that. That doesn't even have a stand, uh, an onboard computer. It just has a Wi-Fi wow. card, right? And you just stream all the video too. I, I think that's going to be the future for VR is mm. we're going to see some really inexpensive headsets coming out that are tied to the cloud. You know, you can only use them when you have the internet, but all of that rendering is done on the cloud and streamed to you. So the idea you mentioned going onto Steam, would that be to get onto the Quest initially and those types of devices? So you know, I already used my Quest um, with the link cable. That, that's not a problem. The reason to put the free version on Steam is, is really to make this data zoo resource more interesting for our scientists. Okay. So, so that when they share things, you know, students in high schools could, could download it and, and yeah. look at it or, you know, whatever. Yeah. And there's potential for like, 3D data is it's massive. And so, you know, you might think you've seen it all, but then you come back to a data set years later. Whereas if anyone could be looking at it, they might contact you and say, I've seen this, you know, particularly Egyptology stuff, because there's tons of people who just have an interest in Egyptology right. and just like that opportunity. And so, you know, it takes citizen science to a different level then. But yeah. usually, yeah, the GPU has been the problem for that. So if there's a route around, that would be good. Cool. Yeah. Uh, another thing that I didn't mention, these narrations that we make, we can also render them out as MP4s. And so we're going to create basically like a Cyglass YouTube channel where all of these things are linked in the data zoo. So you can you can just watch it if you don't have a, a GPU. That would be good, yeah. So I know, yeah, when we were doing that paper on the mummies, it would have been cool to do a bit more. Yeah. Um, but yeah, having a narrated video to explain some of the things you're seeing is gonna be, it'll probably end up in supplementary sure. um, information, which is frustrating, but I think journals will catch up on that and they'll be more used to having these better resources in the paper rather than supplementary. and. You know, visit viewable in line with the text and stuff. So that'd be really good. We, we've had a couple of meetings where we've, where we've said, let's just get rid of the PDF and just, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're a little resistant to that. So yeah. Understandably. But yeah, I can see it. Yeah. The, that type of thing be really useful and makes everything. Yeah. Communication much, much better then. So looking forward to trying just finding the time to try these things. Sure. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. If you try it out, if you run into any, um, uh, hurdles or anything like that, let us know. We can hop on an online session with you and, right. and talk it out. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, on the segmentation, there's like, yeah, the coloring in thing and just knowing that I've colored the middle of something, you just want it to almost like extend to the boundary. Right. Um, I'm guessing that's not possible at the moment, but then the super voxels might be the alternative. Yeah, so we're very interested in, in pushing that aspect forward. And, and having, what we don't really have right now is a group that is trying to use it, failing and asking us for more. Okay. So if you want, you could, you could sort of push us in a direction if you try it and you're like, check out this data set. I did this now just, I just want to uh, dilate the, yeah, the yeah. mask or something like that. Yeah. That'll push us to, to build those systems in. Okay. That would be cool. And like the, the machine learning aspect. That was always bringing something from outside that was machine learning. And I think, yeah, we have talked about this before, but whether there's any scope to bring machine learning into this. Yes. So, so right now it's sort of, um, it's not really completely connected. What we've done here, let me see if I can show a quick video of this. We've, we've built some scripts that we can hand to you 
no problem. That basically can take a collection of regions of interest that you've put down and they will feed those regions of interest into the deep neural network. And then it'll do its thing, which can take you know some amount of time. And then they'll push the results back into SciGlass. So it's it's not a complete pathway through. You have to do a little, um, you know, pushing yourself, but yeah, it's fairly good. So this is Cellpose, which is like a, a a blob identifier, deep neural network applied to here, and you can see that we've gotten these nice labels on each of these cells. Because hmm. you could imagine. Yeah, anatomy stuff, things do look quite different and we can see the difference, but computers can't. Um, and totally. in 2D, you can see why they struggle because you know, the shape of things, depending on the orientation, you, know, you can't be sure if it's one thing or another, but then when you see something in 3D, you can tell it's bone, muscle, lungs, even if it was all the same grayscale, the shape and morphology should do that. So it was, yeah, my dream is where you get to a point where the machine learning is based on like what it can see from it, you know, if someone segmented lungs of a fish, then someone else can bring their fish data in and ultimately you would know, you would look for those branching structures in the 3D. Right. But yeah, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I have no skills in the back end of any of this. I just know that that would be cool. Yeah. So for, for anatomy, like strangely, I applied this, this is the same algorithm that I showed for finding cells. Yeah. And it finds these like cell, these fat cells here. But interestingly, it also, it just sort of super voxel segments these sort of like muscle fibers or these okay. tendrils that move through, which is actually kind of nice because then you just take your merging tool and, ah. and merge those things. Okay. So it's not perfect, but you can see here where this green and this blue, these should be the same label. This is like a, a fiber or yeah. something that's moving through there. I think there is a potential um, to mm. just doing correction yeah. You know, just, just, good. just connect these things. Yeah. And you were doing a citizen science thing before, I think you mentioned with a school, was it? Yeah. So there's a group in Texas that right now they're working on data over time. Ah, so okay. they will be, let me see if I have this data set here. They'll essentially be tracking these little philopodial processes that wiggle around ah. scenes like this. But if you're interested in getting some segmenters, they are eager to work with scientists. Really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. segmenting would be, yeah, there, there are loads of citizen science things for biology, zero block face stuff. The Crick have got some really good projects where they're on, was it um, something zoo? Um, and yeah, those Universe. citizen science. What's that, sorry? Zooniverse. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so you can put your project on there. There was one I saw on Twitter yesterday that was getting people to triage their like children MRI segment, fMRI segmentation huh. as well, just to say good quality or bad quality segmentations. Yeah. Um, and that was like a Tinder style. So it was like swipe left or swipe right if it's good or bad. Yeah. Um, and so that was quite an interesting way of doing it. Um, and obviously that's simplified, but and yep. and the fact is 3D and VR makes all of that more difficult to... Mm -hmm kind of reach people but you know, like you say as things move on more people will have access to this stuff yeah yeah um yeah maybe yeah on segmentation it would be good that the one you just showed on the where it kind of creates those super voxels on the fibers or the threads that could be quite interesting because we've got loads of stained muscle data in there muscle fibers that run and it would be good to look at how it might work on those yeah, if there's even like a little bit of darkness that surrounds them that you could use some sort of thresholding as a, as a mask to make yeah. sure that they don't leak out, it could be viable. Um, this is like active, it's not really research, but it's sort of yeah. research for us. So okay. would we'd love to see your data and, and see if this works. Okay, yeah, I mean, I, I, a stained data set I can check is you know, you've got the biological structure, but often the stain makes it, so CT stain usually with iodine makes lots of things bright. Mm -hmm. The grayscale difference isn't, isn't there so much, but morphologically, they're really different. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I can, I've got tons. I could almost just share a link if you wanted to look at something. Something that I've looked at would be sensible. That would be great. Yeah. Um, and then, Happy to apply the, the super voxel creation to it and show you what it, what comes out. Cool. That'd be awesome. Yeah, if that's all right. I can I can definitely get something 
ready for that. Um, and then, yes, segmentation to STL is something that we've been trying lately. Um, I'm trying to get a good STL. So I know you've got the two sliders, okay, you know, the usual ones. I can't remember the name, but like smoothness and precision usually. Is right. um, so trying to get the right kind of sweet spot of those has been a bit challenging, but it might just be a limitation because the segmentation wasn't great, perhaps. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of the sliders. They're not very informative on what they actually do. Um, precision actually it tries to use higher resolution data. Okay. So it's, it's, it's sort of a misnomer, um, but we, we can try some things and, and work with you on that. Okay. Yeah, I'll try and, um, I've been trying to save some things out, but again, it's pushing it, it's challenging data. It's not like yep. an easy structure to segment. Um, because they're yeah. right now we don't export to STL, but we can, I think very easily. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess I exported it as OBJ. Right. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't really matter to me. Okay. Um, yeah. Sorry. I'm just used to saying STL. To like no problem. No problem. But yeah, if, so you, I, if you do go straight to STL, maybe we should just support that. It, it's really easy for us to add support for it. Um, I mean, that's what I'm just used to. But then, yeah, Jevin, you you deal with um, geometry type data sets. What do people use in the engineering SolidWorks type field? Um, SolidWorks takes STL. Yeah. So STL support would be cool. Um, it's just a way to like simplify um, models would be really good because like, so for example, the plant hopper stuff that's got like 20,000 faces and SolidWorks just goes crazy. So I need yeah. to find a way of like just simplifying it. So like sort of remeshing the, the model before I take it into SolidWorks and then I'd be happy. Do you, do you use um, MeshLab? Uh, no, I should. Should definitely um, check it. They have really great decimation algorithms and it's okay. free. And there's oh, cool. so much in MeshLab. It's mm -hmm. it's awesome. All right, thank you. Yeah, it's worth a go. I used to use GeoMagic, but then that's quite expensive, so we didn't get there anymore. But MeshLab, again, it was a bit of trial and error to see if it destroys your STL and stuff. But, um, yeah, yeah, it can. <laughs> it was worth a go. Yeah, yeah, cool. Thanks for this bonus kind of. <laughs> sure, anytime. Double anytime. shooting chat with with everyone. So yes, <laughs> value for money for Cygar relationship. Um, yeah, Nick. Sorry, I'm, I'm Nick is probably there. Hey, Nick. Oh, sorry. I have a child in the background, so. Uh. <laughs> no problem. So Nick's had some examples where I know you talked about when we were in VR that like the what were you, liver or kidney you were segmenting liver. Me. No, sorry, Michael oh. was segmenting some. <laughs> oh yeah, that was a kidney. Kidney. So it's surrounded by different color material, but like Nick works a lot with bone and so you have you might want to segment like bone will have the same same grayscale if you want to try and almost like d uh or just take apart bones so you segment yeah. certain bones but not others then that's like either you zoom in really close and start coloring and even then i've tried that with some of the next stuff and i end up coloring other bits and yeah and yeah stuff. so yeah i don't know if there's anything that like naturally finds the edges in the new stuff you've got yeah, we could try some. So can you see an edge as a human? Just about, if I'm like really zooming in, but then there's a little bit of blurring of grayscale between the two often. But Nick, you've dealt with, you know, in the Pelican stuff, um, you've been doing a viso segmentation, but. Yeah, like I, I separated the, um, I tried to separate the, what's it called? The cortical is the other bit, isn't it? I, got, I can't remember that. Uh, from the trabecchi. So I wanted to separate those. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I kind of, I'm so used to looking at that data now. I could, you know, I know where it is, but you can't really see, maybe if, it, I'm trying to think if I was in a 2D slice that hadn't been thresholded, it might have been easier to see. Um, although I think they kind of just, you know, the Trebekah just kind of blur into the cortical anyway and the thing I'm looking at, whether it's different in um, other bone, um, human bone or something, I'm not sure, because I know you can separate them out. I have seen it done on something, um, but yeah. Also, the, the, the problems I have as well is um, when I'm uh, scanning something and it's say it's in cardboard tube or a uh, plastic tube or something, the grayscale is the same, for as the bone often and it's um 
it's, it's and if, if it's been quite sort of close up to it it's really hard to just get rid of that and you can't automatically threshold it you've got to just cut right. it open and get rid of it it's a pain in the bum and you can't um i i haven't been able to do the you know to train it to do it either but i mean i haven't spent a lot of time trying to do that so it's just like just get on with it just, just color it <laughs> I, I've run into that same problem and I hate that problem. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we should make like a little spherical cropping system. I mean, it, it, it would just be a round tube, right? So if you could just fit yeah. a circle and say, cut out everything, make everything black outside of this area, that could be really easy and useful. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Um, I know VG Studio, that was always handy. We haven't like, we had a VG Studio version when I first bought my first x-ray machine and I've never got a new version of it but even that one was quite handy and I'd sometimes still take data back just to get rid of the stuff outside of something and use some simple tools mm -hmm. um, but yeah so Nick mostly works with museum specimens and so that's why it's not so easy just to like grab the bone and grip it in a vice and stuff you end up with <laughs> yeah. yeah boxes and cardboard yeah. and things around it oh, and um, yeah cotton wool as well that's a pain to go weirdly it's a pain to get out so. yeah. Um, yeah, because there's sort of bits in there as well that you don't realize are in there. So, so. yeah, I can yeah. imagine inside glass, even the rough painting would be better than a viso, just because you like it is quite therapeutic as well. Just like <laughs> put on some good music and through. Yeah, yeah. If there is an edge that is there in the grayscale, we can probably do some edge enhancement and then potentially use. So you apply that filter it makes that edge stand out brighter. And then you use that data set thresholded just for the edge as a mask to create the super voxels so they don't bleed into each other. I don't know, I'd have to see it and, and do some experimentation, but I'd be happy to look at it if you if you wanted to share. So the masking process, um, yeah, maybe uh, once I get the version, I'll it'll be clear what that involves and stuff then for the super, uh, super voxel. Yeah. So in Cyglass right now, you can mask by thresholding, mm. but the algorithm itself is capable of taking a second channel that, that can be used as the mask that will prevent super voxels from running into each other. So what I showed in that, that video, we had sort of two channels, right? We had the original grayscale. Yeah which is, you know, here, but then we have the second green channel that we used as the mask. So, and this was done by deep neural network, the, the mask, the green channel was done with deep neural networks, which is a pain that you don't necessarily want to go through, but, you know, maybe we can do an edge detection, yeah. run a filter, create a, a new second channel that is sort of edge enhanced and then use the brightness of those edges as a mask. Okay. We'll have to see, I guess. And but... that needs to be a 3D mask effectively rather than just a few 2D slices, okay. Yeah, we would just take the same data, that same yeah. region, but then apply some, some new filters to it to try to make it look different. Make that pop, yeah. yeah. Okay, ah, oh, that could potentially be really interesting, yeah. Because what we've always tried to do or what we want to get to is a position where because we're a correlative imaging facility where you can like Jebin's doing take your sample do some eds chemical analysis that gives you a slice that is from within your 3d volume and then you like back propagate through your volume based on the chemistry of the eds so you can have the 3d chemistry from just doing a few 2d slices eds but um, that might be a bit much at the moment for this but that's cool is there will there always be a connection from the gray level to like the chemistry that is happening? I'm hoping so. Um, it depends could... how subtle that is, but we see it on like, if you have a fraction of a percent difference in calcium um, between a region, then you end up with a different x-ray attenuation. So for gotcha. things like bone and biological mineralized materials, that's, that's nice, that's enough. Um, and then, you know, if we strap in nano indentation to that, because we see a difference in the nanomechanical properties in areas with different chemistry, then you can potentially have this like 3D volume and you're assumed, you'd have to do some validation and checks, but your chemistry yeah. and mechanical properties of the 3D thing as well. And like almost like a heat map right. coloring populated through. That's the dream of that. That um, would be cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, hard to do though, but yeah. So 
by the time we do that, maybe there'll be a way of you know, back propagating through this type of data then as well. Sure. Hmm, cool. Excellent. Yeah, it's been super useful to, to chat about these things. I appreciate your time after the, uh, and for doing the thing with Mark as well and his, his MSC group as well. So I think. Anytime. Anytime you, you want to talk to us, we're here. Real. Excellent. Um, yeah, Jeb and Nick, have you got anything? Other questions on stuff? Not really, no. <laughs> yeah, you haven't actually used Cyglass, so I guess going into that would be the next thing and just having to play with it and, and trying out painting within it is fun. Because <laughs> you can just delete. If you paint something wrong, you can rub it back out. So that's good. That's when, good because you can't always do that in other things. It's <laughs> yeah. no undo in other things, is there? So. No. <laughs> <laughs> you've done it wrong, you've done it wrong. <laughs> Awesome. Brill. All right. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm going to head off, but I don't know if um, you were done with Swansea at this point, I guess, Cyglass gang. Yeah, I think yeah, that's Mark, pretty much it. Yeah, I'm going to speak to Mark again or anything today, no? No, I don't think so. Cool. All right. Yeah, well, I'll let you go. I think it's been recording this whole time because I took over. Um, Perfect. So Mark will have a bit longer. Um, and so maybe you'll watch it back and have some thoughts as well. But yeah, excellent. I appreciate okay. it. Great. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Have a great rest Good of your talking. day. All right, see you. Bye. Bye.